Good, good. Uh, thank you, Uncle Olvain. Uh, always a pleasure to be online. And um, I just want to pray quickly, Father, thank you that uh, we can come together, everyone that's online, that's present tonight. Uh, we just honor you. We say thank you, Lord, that we can spend time in your word, that we can learn, that we can open up our hearts, that we can open up our spirits. Lord, we are really here to receive and we want to be trained by you, Holy Spirit. So whatever it is that you want to illuminate to each person tonight, God, I pray that you will touch on that, that you will increase our, our understanding, Lord, that you will make us powerful in what we know so that we can establish more, so that we can take action. So I just pray your blessing over tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, so tonight we are concluding Women's Month. And uh, what a month it's been. It feels like um, it was only a, a short period of time. But I trust tonight that we, we, we will all be, um, yeah, that we will be filled with uh, a good message. The book of Ruth is really something that I like to teach on. Uh, there's so much to learn. And uh, tonight I just, I, I, I want to ask, you know, just look into what is being said. And uh, we really want to encourage everyone to have a love for the word. And I really try and make it uh, practical so that it's not just a teaching, but it also teaches us, because uh, firstly it teaches myself, just to have a love for the word and how to take the word and to uh, look at it from a perspective of what can I learn from this piece of scripture. So the book of Ruth is only has uh, uh, four chapters. And I gave it the heading of There is Always Hope. Now, in the book of Ruth, it is one of those books that really looks into the lives of people. And it is really an outworking of people in relationships. So, in this book, God is mentioned. People speak of God when they speak a word of, of, of describing something. But God is not physically active. There's but speaking, there's not the word of the Lord came to someone or a vision or anything like that. It is really a story, but so powerful because God is involved in the people's lives and it brings forward hope. It brings forward restoration and it brings forward the kingship line, which I will go through. So so let's let's get into it immediately. What is the background and the scene? So the book of Judges is thought to be written by Samuel, the prophet Samuel. It's not 100% sure, but it seems as though he's the author. And the book is written in the timeline of Judges. So remember, uh, we thought of when Judges ruled. It is a period in the time of Israel um, where the Judges ruled. Now, during this period... This is the scene, or this is when the book of Ruth takes place. So during this time, as you know from, from, from Judges, is that there is a big fallback of the Israelites, of God's people. There comes a leader, the leader falls, the leader goes into pagan worship, or he sins, or he turns back. Uh, um, you know, to the sins of, of the previous leaders. So just, there's just a complete disarray. And, and God's hand is not on the land. God's hand is not on the people anymore. So you are looking at a setting of unrighteous people, of an unrighteous society. So here it takes place, or the book starts, uh, in an area of Judah called Bethlehem. We all know Bethlehem. And I just made a note here to say Bethlehem means the house of bread. It is the Hebrew meaning, and I'm going to tell you why I put it in there. So during this time, God, the people are not serving God. They are not following after his decrees, everything that is put in place. So God removes his hand, and, and as we learn from Scripture, as soon as God removes his hand, there's no more blessing. The crops aren't blessed, the land, the ground. Everything is not blessed anymore. So there was a great famine, a, a, a very, very bad famine where um, there's no food. There is not enough for the people to live from. And you must think about this. It must be extremely desperate times if you want to leave your homeland, the land that you know, uh, because we are, we, are, we are starting off with Hebrew people, with Naomi. 
and uh, uh, Elimelech, they are Hebrew people, they are Jewish people, and they are now considering leaving the homeland, the, the land of milk and honey, to go to another foreign land to look just for food, just to survive. They are not looking to go and start businesses or anything. They just want to go so that they can feed themselves. So you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, the, the culture or the, the thought process behind it because the Hebrews had a culture of, listen, this is our land, the land that is given to us. So, you know, there is there's this feedback from someone there, I'm not 100% sure. So it is a really, it's a desperate call to go to a homeland. So we, we start off this story, Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons are embarking on a journey just to seek food. Now, just a note, as we are going to discuss a lot of uh, uh, the Hebrew culture, is Elimelech is from the tribe of Judah. So they are, uh, uh, they are the Hebrew people. Okay, so the story begins. The story begins. Elimelech, Naomi, and their two sons travel to a foreign country called Moab. Now, I've put in a map for you again. As you can see where Bethlehem is in the land of Judah. So Moab is opposite the Red Sea. And Moab is a traditionally enemy of, is of Israel. So you can read in many scriptures in the Old Testament, uh, one, one reference is 1 Samuel 14 verse 47, is the Moabites are, as a tribe are, are enemies of Israel. They have many times risen up against Israel. So once again, think of this. I am a Hebrew. I am from the tribe of Judah, the land God has given me. And I'm now thinking of going to my enemy's land, to my enemy's territory. And I'm going there to seek food for my family. You can imagine it must be such a, such a big decision, such a fearful decision to make. But here they are, Elimelech and Naomi, their two sons going into my and now trying to make a living there. So the two sons are called Malon, which means sickness, and Shilion, which means destruction. So here they are. They arrive in Moab. Uh, uh, they are there. So what happens? Bad thing happens. Elimelech passes away. It doesn't say in the scripture why he passed away, but he is no longer there. So Naomi is now a widow. She's there with her two sons. And the two sons decide they are going to take Moab wives for themselves. So Marlon takes on Ruth and Shilian takes on Orpah as their wives. And they live for a period of 10 years. But let me just go back into tra tradition. And there's a lot in scripture that we must look at tradition because it will give us a better idea. So in the Hebrew culture... If you were a Hebrew, so if you were a Jewish, uh, a Hebrew, God's chosen people, part of the Israelites, you were not allowed to marry someone from another tribe or a foreign land. So in this instance, these Hebrew sons, Malon and Chilion, took on Moab, Moabite wives. It was not really allowed specifically that uh, the Hebrew, uh, uh, female Hebrews was not allowed at all to take on a Moab uh, 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 husband, not at all. But a, 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 a Hebrew man could take on a Moabite uh, 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 as, as his wife, but actually only in the third generation of their conversion. So what was the prerequisite? The Moabite person so, for instance, Ruth had to be converted, had to be converted as a Hebrew, as a Jewish person and in, into what their beliefs were. So you can just think of you are God's chosen people. You go into a foreign country, which is an enemy of you. You go there and you take wives from that land. It, it, it just must have been a crazy setting. So let's look at this. Ruth. A Moabite, uh, a Moabite female is now married to Marlon, okay? Uh, her name means friend. And then Orpah, 
which is now the Moabite wife to Chilean. Let me just give you some background of that, something I didn't know. It is very interesting. Is Orpa is the mother of Goliath. And uh, that is very significant for our story, which I will maybe not go ahead of. I will give it to you later on. But Orpa uh, had four sons from uh, a Nephilim. Uh, we're not going to speak about that. It's something that is made reference of as a, 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 the sons of man, which is referred to giants. So Orpa is the mother of Goliath, which I'll talk about later. So here they are. They are they lived in the in, in, in this country, making a living, just getting food, eating for a period of 10 years. And then what happens next? Another tra tragedy happens is the two sons of Naomi, the widow, passes away. Marlon and Chilean passes away. It also doesn't say why they passed on, but uh, uh, so Naomi's two sons and her husband in the land of, of, of Moab, passed away. So then, with this tragedy, Naomi is very sad. She's got her two daughters-in-law, as we read in Ruth 1, verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab, so someone in the country of the region, said that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. What, what is the Hebrew meaning for Bethlehem? It is, uh, remember what I said, it is uh, uh, um, the place of bread. So now, in the place of bread, their homeland, God is providing to the people. Can you just imagine, you know, you left because there was famine, and now you hear in your place, your, your, your hometown, God is visiting the people and giving them bread. Wow. That must have just added to the sorrow of Naomi. She has lost her husband in this foreign land. She has lost her two sons. And now she is hearing God has provided for the people of her hometown. And she decides, listen, I need to go back there. So what happens? She's got her two daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. And she says to them, my, my, my daughters, I want to tell you that I, or I want to bless you today. I want to tell you, may God look after you. She said, may God look after you, been good to my sons. So I want to bless you, and I want to tell you, rather go back to your mother's house and remain here in your home country because I have got nothing further to give to you. I've got nothing that I can give you. So stay behind. I am going to go back to my hometown. I'm going to go back to Judah. I'm going to go back to Bethlehem and I'm going to see what I can do here. So the two of them says to them, they kiss one another and they say, no, Naomi, we cannot leave you. We want to stay by your side. Let us go with you. So, so Naomi, again, you can read that in the scriptures, in Ruth 1. She says to them, listen here a second time. She says, Ruth, uh, Ruth and Orpah, listen to me carefully. I am of old age. Even if I do get another husband and I get children, how long are you going to wait for these sons to grow up so that they can be your husbands? I cannot give you. I cannot give you more husbands. There is nothing I can do for you. Uh, you are better off by staying here and continuing on your journey in your home country. I am going back. Please stay here. So once again, they kiss one another. They are weeping. They are crying. And Orpah decides to leave. She takes the instruction from Naomi and she leaves. But Ruth clings on to Naomi. And here we see the loyalty being tested. So what does what does Ruth say to Naomi in Ruth 1 verse 16 to 17? But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do to me, uh, do so to me, and more also, if anything, but death parts you and me. Here, Ruth boldly says, you, just look at 
Misha. So a Moabite woman that is a pagan woman, they worship a god called Shemosh. That is their god. They've got different culture, different uh, uh, traditions. She marries these the, into a Hebrew family. She has she she must have gotten converted. She must have known God through Naomi, through her, through her husband who has passed away, and 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 she's become an, she's become a a, a woman of valor. Uh, uh, and here she is laying her life down for her mother-in-law, who is different country serving a different God. It is very bold, and it 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 just of something that has happened in the 10 years that Ruth has stayed or has been in the in fellowship with Naomi. Something must have happened. And, and, and this is something to take note of, is that relationship. So yes, she says, listen, I am not going to let you travel by yourself. I am going to stay with you. How powerful is that? She, see, she, she just reaffirms her commitment and her loyalty towards Naomi. So let's look at the arrival in Bethlehem. So here, Ruth and Naomi embark back to the home country of Naomi. They go back to Bethlehem. And when they arrive there, the people were so excited to see Naomi. Because remember, in the community, everyone knows one another. And they, they had a piece of land. They were, they were Hebrew Jews staying there. And everyone was excited. But look at what, 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 uh, what Naomi says in Ruth 1 verse 20. She says to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full. And the Lord has brought me back home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me. And the Almighty has afflicted me. So Mara means bitter. So Naomi went out with the whole family, comes back without her sons, comes back as a widow. Uh, so she is bitter. She 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 knows that or, or her feeling at that point in time is that the Lord has afflicted her because she has left and she went to a foreign country. Now they are back and they are back in a significant time in the, in, in the Hebrew setting. So it's the time or the start of the spring barley harvest. So if you go and study that, it is significant because it also falls in line with the Hebrew festivals. So it's very close to the day of Pentecost. So they just arrived there. And remember, they're only coming back for one reason. They just want something in their stomach. They just want some food. They want to be fed. So here is the setting. Here is a... Uh, is a That, that's being introduced Ruth to, we see a name called Boaz. So Boaz is a family and a relative of Elimelech. And we're going to get to that. So they're from the same clan. They are also from the tribe of Judah. And in the word, it says that Boaz was a noble man. He was a very wealthy man. He was a man of prominence. So he wasn't just a big time farmer. He was also a man of stature. There was something in him. And we are going to get to see that later. So let's just look at this. This is very significant. And I hope you're all taking notes of the little nuggets that we are going to put it together for this powerful story. So Boaz is the son of Rahab. Who is Rahab? She is the prostitute that looked after the spies of Joshua. So Look at this. Solomon is his father. He was a Hebrew man. So he was from the tribe of Judah. So he was a devout Jew. Rahab was a Canaanite. A Canaanite was someone uh, that was specifically in sin. They also had idol worship, but specifically in sexual immorality. It's where she came from. So he was half Hebrew, half Canaanite, which we're going to get to later. So here is Naomi and Ruth staying in the city somewhere, probably like, like Jesus somewhere in a shack, if we can call it that. They just want to get food. So in the harvest time, Ruth asked Naomi, can I go out in the fields so that I can just gather some harvest for us 
And Naomi said to her, go, my daughter, go and may they just be a blessing upon you. And uh, sorry, I just put in the reference of the stature of Boaz to explain to you that he's a God's man. In Ruth 2 verse 4, it says, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers. So his people that are busy cultivating his land, that busy harvesting, the Lord be with you. And they, they answered him, the Lord bless you. So you can see he's a man that had God in his life. So let's look at it. Ruth is in the field. Naomi says to her, go out in the field. Remember, she's just trying to get food to eat. That's the main thing. So in that time, you, in, the, in the word, you read the word gleaning. So gleaning is the act of collecting leftover crop from the farmer's fields after they have been commercially harvested or the fields where it is not economic to harvest. It is a pra practice described in the Hebrew Bible that became a legally enforced entitlement of the poor in a number of Christian kingdoms. So what was happening? The, the, the barley or the grain fields were being harvested. And as the harvesters move through the land, they are, because they didn't have these big uh, trucks like we have, it, uh, tractors that we have today, it was all done by hand. So as they are busy moving through field and field and field, there are little bits that is left behind. And they made it part of the Hebrew culture, legal thing that anyone, the poorest of the poor, can then follow behind the harvesters, come and collect what they can, and they can keep it for themselves. Okay? So here is Ruth in the field, following after, we call it gleaning, because you're picking up the scraps, you're picking, literally picking over the leftovers behind. And what happens? She's there, she's working hard, and here comes Boaz. He comes and he looks and he comes to his, his harvesters and he says, God bless you. And they say to him back, God bless you. And he says to one of his workers, but who is that woman? Who does she belong to? And the worker says to Boaz, she is Ruth. She is she is Naomi's mother-in-law, and immediately, because Boaz knows that his relative is Eli, he knows that they are people that have returned. Immediately, there's a connection. Immediately, there is favor. Let's look at it. So then Boaz, Boaz approaches Ruth in Ruth 2, 2, verse 8 to 16, and then he said to her, look at this, immediately. You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field. Immediately he says, listen, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't worry. Just stay in my field. And, and you can imagine it is quite a form of protection because no, no one knows what might happen to you, even if it's a, a Hebrew law that the poorest of poor can come and collect. You are not safe. In those times, you were not safe in, uh, uh, um, as, a, as a young woman in anyone's field. But stay close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? Second thing he says, I will give you protection. No one will touch you. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. So his workers are enjoying water or lunch or whatever it is. And he says, you can go and you can have. It's something that is not known of in that culture. Remember, there is cultures and ways of doing things. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me? For I am a foreigner. It means that I am not a Hebrew person. I'm a Moabite. I come from a different country. Even though I am, I am a widow from a, a, a family. And Boaz answered and said to her, it has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law. So immediately he knows, he has heard the story of what has happened in Moab. And then come back and that Ruth, uh, from another tribe, from another tradition has come and she's followed after her mother-in-law because she has made a decision to be devout to her. Since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother 
and the land of your birth and have come to a people who you did not know before. Once again, we are saying it was very bold of Ruth to follow after Naomi. The Lord repay you for your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of the maidservants. Now Boaz said to her in the meal, at the mealtime, so busy eating. Look at this. I mean, there is, there is traditions and no one just comes and eats with the land owner. But what does Boaz say to her? Come here and eat of the bread. And dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she was having a meal with him. I mean, most of his other workers would probably not have sat and ate with him. And she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young woman, uh, young men, saying, let her glean. So let her move behind his men among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Do not touch her. Also, let grain from the bundles fall purposely. So not just picking up the scraps anymore. Now the workers are intentionally letting some more fall so she can pick it up. Powerful, powerful. Leave it so that she may glean and do not rebuke her. This is, this is just, it's amazing how, how this is all coming together. How she finds favor with someone because of her decision to be loyal towards Naomi. So what happens? She's working the field. She's working hard. It says in the words that she worked until late that evening. Later, she returned back to Naomi in the city and she took everything that she had. She beat it off. She cleansed it. She took out all the grains of barley she had and she gave it to Naomi to eat. And it says in the words she had until she was satisfied. And then what happens? After Naomi had something to eat, Naomi says to her, Ruth, please give me some feedback. How was your day? Where did you glean today? Where did you harvest? How was it? In whose field? And she says, she says to her, listen, I was in Boaz's field. Immediately, immediately Naomi's hope is restored because she knew that there was a redeemer a redeemer, and we're going to get to that now. What is a redeemer? There was a redeemer for her to restore her and to restore her family. And immediately she encouraged Ruth and said, Ruth, this is a great thing that has happened because Boaz is of the clan of my late husband, Elimelech. Things are going to look up for you and for me. And with that, immediately, Naomi had great vision. She had foresight. She knew what was going to happen next. She knew that there was a great plan that was going to come together. Let's look at this. She says in Ruth 3, verse 1 to 5, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you? What does that mean? Shall I not seek a husband for you? You've been good to me. Now I must return that, that it may be well with you. Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So just to, just to tell you what that is, that is winnowing at the threshing floor. So winnowing of the grains or barley means throwing it up in the air, the wind blows it, and it takes off the chaff off the grain. And that is the threshing floor where they are pressing everything. Okay. Therefore, so she's, she's saying, Naomi is saying to Ruth, Boaz is going to be at the threshing floor tonight because this is now at the end of the harvest season. The entire harvest season is done and all the grains, all the harvest, all the crop is in one place. And Boaz is going to be there. He's going to prepare the grains. And you are going to see him there. So what does she say? She says, therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Now, remember, in those times, once again, the tradition. If you were a widow, you would have looked different in appearance to someone who was not a widow. So she's saying, wash yourself 
look good, look different, put on different clothes, and then go to him and wait for him there until he has finished eating and drinking. And also, it, it was very dangerous to be seen with a woman uh, uh, in that tradition. So no one had to see her. Then it shall be, when he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. And he will tell you what you should do. And Ruth responded, I shall do what you tell me to do. She just said, I am, I'm going to do this because she trusts Naomi with this plan that she has. Now, Boaz was out and he was busy preparing his grain, busy preparing everything. And then afterwards, it was custom that they would have had a bit of a feast. So he was eating, he was drinking, he was very merry, it says in the uh, 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 Ruth 3 verse 7. It says that he was merry and he went to lie down on one of the heaps of grain. What happens next is Ruth, exactly as Naomi said to her, while he was busy sleeping, she went and she laid, she uncovered his feet. Very significant. I'm going to tell you why now. She goes and lays by his feet and she's just laying there. And the next moment he wakes up, he wakes up and he sees her there. And let's see what happens next. Okay. So, so before we get to that, is there is a redeeming work. So we are going to go back into the tradition. And so Boaz is a kingsman redeemer. So it is a law, a law you can read of it in the Levitical order. It is in the Hebrew Bible, the rabbinical tradition. It is a person who, as the nearest relative of another, is charged with the duty of restoring the rights of another and avenging his wrongs. And it's also, he was considered the redeemer of the family's reputation and married the widow of a man who dies to keep her husband's name alive and take care of the land. So what is it? It is a close relative that can come in and redeem. They can buy your land. They can marry you as the widow and they do not give you the surname that they have. They keep your surname so that your inheritance is kept and you can continue with your family line. So in honor of your husband has passed away and they can redeem wrongdoings. They can go back and take land that is stolen. If you are sold into slavery, they can redeem you and bring you back. It is it's so powerful. Boaz is one of these people, and that is the foresight that Naomi had. She knew that Boaz was a kingsman redeemer in their family, and that Ruth could be redeemed. She could be redeemed through Boaz. So there is some scripture references for you uh, with regards to kingsman redeemer. One of them that you will know very well in Luke 20 verse 28 is when the Pharisees asked Jesus, when this man dies and his brother takes his wife and, he's, and they don't have a child and the next one marries him and he dies. Remember that, uh, that question I asked? It is referred to exactly that, Kingsman Redeemer. So let's look at this. How Boaz responded to Ruth going to lay by his feet. He wakes up and he says, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter. What a response. For you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning. Remember, at the beginning is when she started following Naomi with loyalty. And now she is more kind because she's following the instruction of what Naomi said. In that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. How powerful is that? And now, my daughter, do not fear. Immediately, I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Listen, you don't just, as a Moabite, the enemy of the Israelites, from a foreign land, come in into a Hebrew Jewish culture and is seen as a virtuous woman. It doesn't just happen. So something in Ruth, just stood up and it became powerful for as we close. Now it is that I am a close relative. Here he confirmed demon. But however, here's a spanner in the works. 
which they didn't know of. However, there is a relative closer than I. So there is someone that is a kinsman redeemer before them. Stay this night that in the morning I will speak to him. Oh, it reads, in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. So if he redeems you, he will redeem you. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you. So he's saying, I'm going to go to the person first in line. I'm going to tell him, hopefully he does, and he redeems you. If not, I will do, I will do it. And then further on he says, lie down until morning. And that lie down, it doesn't refer to any relations. Because in the, in the word, when we see he went to go lay with her or she went to go lay with him, it speaks of relations that they have had. In this case, it was not. He told her to lay down and be safe and early morning go out so that no one sees you. You were here with me. No one sees your face. So what does she do? Boaz doesn't just send her off and, and make sure she goes away without someone seeing her. She does, he gives her a whole handful of stuff, probably to help her carry as well so no one can see who she is, but sending her back with good, sending her back with food. So here she goes back and, and she returns to Naomi. She immediately says to Naomi, yo, it was, it, was, it was just amazing. Everything that you said happened, happened. And Boaz sent all the stuff to you to enjoy with me. And Naomi immediately says to her, listen, wait here, because that man, Boaz, will not rest until he has done what he said he will do. In the scripture, we read that. So, so, so let's look at the redemption of Ruth. And here is a, a reference scripture, which is so powerful. Psalms 37, verse 3 to 5. This is the story. Trust. This is the amplified version. Trust. Lean on, rely on, and be confident in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land and feed surely on his faithfulness. And truly you shall be fed. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he will give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll and repose each care of your load on him. Trust, lean on, rely on, and be confident also in him, and he will bring it to pass. Powerful. When you read that scripture, you think of the example. So, Boaz goes, and this is really significant. You can read this in Ruth 4. So, Boaz has great wisdom of how to approach this. Remember, there's someone that is first in line. To be the redeemer. Okay. So what does he do? Everything is very significant. Once again in tra the traditions of the Hebrew people. So remember in the city. Always at the gates. At the gates of the city is where business takes place. It is where business is confirmed. It is where agreements are made. So, so it's, it's normally where the elders sit. And conduct all the things. And if there is someone needs to be judged. Everything happens at the gates, okay? So it's significant. So Boaz goes and he, and, and he passes by the Redeemer, the actual first in line Redeemer. He says, come with me and sit down. Then Boaz goes and gets 10 of the elders and they sit together. And then he immediately, he speaks to this uh, first in line Redeemer and he gives the story. He says, Elimelech has passed away. Naomi has come back with, uh, 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 with Ruth and her sons passed away. So their land needs to be bought and their family needs, uh, 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 they need to be redeemed. So first he says, he only mentions Naomi. He says the land needs to be redeemed. You are the first in line. Do you want to redeem? And the redeemer says, yes, I will redeem. And how's this? Boaz then, only after the Redeemer says, yes, I will do it. Boaz says to him, by the way, Ruth is now the widow of Naomi's son, son of Elimelech. So when you do this redeeming work, you also have to redeem her. What does that redeeming of her mean? It means you have to take her as your wife. Now what that means is, 
is remember the redeeming work is when you redeem that family, that family's surname is kept. So you don't give it. I don't give Smith whatever it was. It is kept. So that might interfere with someone's inheritance. So immediately this redeem is no. I it's it's going to affect my inheritance because now I have to look after another line, uh, uh, another family line. So so no no no. I'm not interested anymore. And immediately he says in front of everyone, Boaz. He says. Okay, then will you agree with me that I am the full redeemer of Naomi and Ruth and I take her as my wife. And once again, important for tradition is this, this legally bound agreement between them in front of the council of elders is done by taking off your sandal. It was like you and I today, we go to a attorney, we sign, it gets stamped, it's filed in the deeds of. That's how powerful this agreement was. And look, look how powerful this whole situation is. The marriage of Boaz and Ruth is sealed. And the people there uh, immediately through this agreement gives them a blessing. Let's look at that. Ruth 4 verse 11 to 12. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephratia and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this woman. Oh, powerful. If you just get the whole picture of this, it is so powerful. They are being blessed. They are by being blessed by the fellow countrymen, by the fellow tribe of Judah. They are blessing Boaz. They are giving them the blessing. They are giving Ruth the blessing. They are saying, welcome, Ruth. May you, may you be blessed. May you be a, a, a prosperous woman. And then that part which the Lord will give you from this woman. Let's look at that. Powerful. It goes on to a lineage which you and I know today. Coming of the king. So Ruth 4 verse 13 to 17. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when, she and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord. Who has not left you this day. He has added on to her. Without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. So what, what happens here. Is Ruth. And Boaz. Has a son. And his name was. Obed. Who is Obed. Obed is the father of David. Powerful. Obed is the grandfather of David. And David is the lineage of Jesus Christ. How, how amazing is the story? It is a pagan woman called Ruth who is into pagan worship, is married into a family which is not really allowed. There is sort of a gray area there. And she married into a Hebrew, a proper Hebrew family, the line of the tribe of Judah. Her husband dies and she follows her mother-in-law and she goes back to, Be to Bethlehem, the land, the homeland of her mother-in-law. She meets Guy Boaz, whose mother is a prostitute and is married to another Hebrew man Okay, called Solomon, they have a son and his name is Boaz. This is very significant. Why? Because in the, in, in the kingship of David and later on Jesus Christ, there is Gentiles involved because R Ruth is a Gentile. Boaz was married into a, 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 the tribe of Judah, but he's half Canaanite and half Jew. So can you see how that is? Is it is, you know, <laughs> it is this two different, it's not a pure line that comes down. It's these people 
who through God's involvement in their own in their own uh, uh, lives being committed, following, trying to be good, being loyal towards someone else, is blessed. And out of that blessing came the line of Jesus Christ. That is so powerful. That is so powerful. And uh, as a summary tonight, I call it link to life because I really want us to look at, if I read the book of Ruth, what does it say to me when I read it? What can I take from it? Firstly, God is there through everything. God was there with Naomi through the tough times. She got bitter and called herself Mara, but God was still with her. God had a plan, even though he wasn't present. He didn't uh, speak to a prophet to give a word. He was there and he was present in everything. Secondly, God's word is yes and amen. If God says to you, I'm going to bless you in the land of milk and honey, he is going to bless you. Is You know, Naomi left. Her family died. She thought, ah, in the regret, I shouldn't have left because God said, and then God, remember, he gave bread to the people. She went back. God's word is yes and amen. And we can stand on his word in what he says. Then even when making the wrong decision, God is with you. Listen, Naomi might have made the wrong decision to go to Moab, a different, a different place. But God was still with her and God still added to her and blessed her when she came back. Sometimes we think, yo, when I made the wrong decision, God's left me. It's not true. God is with you and he will even lead you through your wrong decision. Next thing, people will follow. When you are carrying or living the image and likeness of God. Listen, Naomi must have carried something or must have, uh, the presence of God must have been in her. Because why would someone like Ruth leave her home country, leave everything she knows, her family, her mother's house, to follow this woman? There must have been something. So people will follow you, not because who you are, or your personality, or your strength, or your char charisma. But they will follow you because of the true life of God or the image of God in your life. Loyalty is a godly characteristic. This is powerful. The, the story starts out in loyalty. And because of loyalty, the loyalty is outworked. And it's gone back as a blessing to the original person. And it is, so it's always returned. Out of loyalty, out of loyalty, Ruth followed Naomi. And out of that loyalty... The, the blessing is brought onto her and back to Naomi. Isn't that powerful? You know, loyalty is very important for us as a godly characteristic. The Redeemer lives. How powerful is that? You must see this is very significant. What did Ruth go and do? She went to go lie at the feet of Boaz, the Kingsman Redeemer. What do we do? We go and lie by the feet of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And when we lie at his feet, it is like he goes like Boaz and he goes to the council. Jesus goes to God and he, medi and he mediates for us a better thing so that we can be redeemed, set free. Isn't that powerful? The, the, the imagery in this book is so powerful. And there's lots more than I'm just saying now. God can use anyone. God used a pagan girl. And from that, the line of kingship, David and Jesus Christ. God uses people to bless us and help us. Listen, it is important for us not to be lone rangers because God will use people to help you, encourage you, bless you and create something better in you. Mentorship is very important. When you look at the link of servanthood leadership in, 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 in Ruth and Naomi, it is the same as Elisha and Elijah. And mentorship is important for us because it blesses us. By the love we have for another, we can be recognized as God's people. How powerful is that? When we stick to one another, we love one another, we are loyal to one another. It is a characteristic of the world that they need to see. And then lastly, the Jesus is the model. Because everything that we read here, all the symbolism, the imagery is Jesus is the model 
We follow after Him. We are loyal to Him. We love Him. He is our Redeemer. And He is our complete model for uh, life. If we look at what He has done, it is the same story as we see in the book of Ruth. I'm going to leave it there so that we can just have some questions tonight. Uncle Olving, uh, I'm going to hand over to you at this point in time. And let's open the floor uh, if there's any questions. Well, voter, we're blessed. I mean, really, just leave that just leave that link to life page open. I mean, there is so much truth. There's so much life. There's so much affirmation of, of God's character and God's nature and God's purpose and plan for our lives in that, that um, I think you could spend weeks just just going over this mm -hmm. and just bring out all the nuggets that, that's hidden in the word and you can just expand upon it and expand upon it and expand upon it and I just think you could never stop because there's just so much life, there's so much uh, revelation and like you said, Jesus is the model and it doesn't matter where we are, who we are, what mistakes we've made. God is still involved in our lives. God is still caring for us. God is still working for us. There's still hope. Uh, because the Redeemer lives, we have hope. We have a future. We have yeah. a destiny. We have a purpose. Uh, before I start preaching, uh, uh, absolutely yeah. powerful. Very, very good. Uh, has anyone got any questions for voter this evening? You're welcome to raise, raise your hand and we'll uh, you can unmute and ask the question. I think everyone is so blessed I don't really know what to say. Yeah, I, I, I want I just want to add something that I, that I felt is is necessary. So uh, the link to life I I, I really felt like we can relate and we can get something from the book of Ruth. And, you know, I just realized again that the word of God is really like when you watch your favorite episode that is gripping. You know, those where you watch one and then, oh man, I have to wait another week so that I can find out what is next. The word of God is really like that. And when I studied the book of Ruth, there's so much introspection that we can do just just uh just the hebrew traditions and what the hebrews lived out from day to day if you have a better understanding of that you will already have a different outlook on the word because you would understand why they do something how do, what is the reason from what tradition does it what is the tradition called you know that is all stuff that makes us more able to understand the word rather than just reading it yeah absolutely true because uh, you know and that's one of the foundations of studying the word is finding out about when it was written why it was written who it was written for what was the culture if you take and embrace all those things and then you build that picture, then then the understanding and the revelation really comes about as to what is going on and, and why these things happen. And if it wasn't for the culture or the tradition, um, then Boaz would not have redeemed Ruth. Uh, and, it's, and it's very interesting to say that then someone had an opportunity, but when, when it came to the crunch, and he said, "No, listen. I don't want. I don't want to marry her because I, I, I will redeem her field, but I'm not prepared to take on the responsibility and accountability of looking after her." And he said, "Okay, don't worry. I'll do it." So Jesus is yeah. saying, "You know, there may be. There is not another. I am the one. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So let God be our redeemer. Let Jesus be our hope and our salvation." Any questions from anyone this evening? You, you feel to ask voter any questions that you like relative to the subject matter, of course. Everyone's very quiet tonight. <laughs> yeah, I think I think like me, they they all blown apart by what has been revealed. Pastor Hannes, have you got anything you want to you want to ask? No, just it was uh, good, and uh, I think this uh, link to life and uh, relationship with this page and. Uh, you know, and Ruth, the book of Ruth is just amazing. Ruth was a, was a, a um, yeah, she was a, not an alien, but you said she was pagan. Um, she was a Gentile, and yet there's a book in the Bible around her because Jesus comes sure. out of her. It's, it's just amazing. A whole book in the Bible on Ruth, that's a, and it speaks of us, how important us as Gentiles are. Uh,
us were with, you know, God the Father that loves us so much that he adopts us into the lineage of Jesus or in Jesus Christ. Well done. It is great stuff. Yeah, and I think I think it's fitting that we end that we end on this because you know what we we we've spoken about uh, a number of women in the Bible and look they all had favor they were they were all had favor they all had virtue they all had character they all had uh, something special that God had placed in them so I think it's befitting that we finish with the root with Ruth and that it brings forth the, the lineage, uh, as you say, from Obed all the way through to David and then from David to Jesus. So it's very, 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 very good. So, Vokta, thanks very much. Thank you very much, everyone. I really trust Thank that you. you blessed this evening. Nobody wants to ask any questions. But um, may you really have a great week. And may the, may the life of Ruth and the other women uh, of the Bible that we've studied May it bring an inspiration to you. May it encourage you. May it give you a hope, even if you feel sometimes that you are in a in a desperate situation. There is redemption. There is a hope. There is a purpose. Be blessed. Thanks very much for joining us. Next week we're going to start uh, a new topic. We're going to start looking at um, the pastoral letters uh, covering um, Timothy, Titus, uh, and Thessalonians. Uh, it's going to be very good. Uh, I will start off next week. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Be blessed. Thank you.